that is what makes the reception of his work difficult too, is that it's alive and it's pure process and he doesn't take the step of thinking, what is this object going to look like when it's finished? What's the end result going to be? I'm Ben Davis, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. Harry Everett Smith is an odd figure to come across in an art museum. That's because he's not known primarily as a visual artist at all. For most, Harry Smith is probably best known as the compiler of the legendary Anthology of American Folk Music, a landmark collection of early recordings published in 1952, which became a huge influence on the folk music revival and through that on rock in the 1960s. Born in 1923 and passing away in 1991, Harry Smith was a lot of things. He was a big figure in the beat generation and close to Allen Ginsberg. He appeared in one of Andy Warhol's screen test films. He was also a tireless collector of all kinds of cultural objects, from out-of-print records to Ukrainian Easter eggs. He was also an experimental filmmaker and artist, an early student of anthropology, and an acolyte of a variety of mystical belief systems. Now, the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York is hosting Fragments of a Faith Forgotten, the Art of Harry Smith. And this unusual show has an unusual curator as well, the artist Carol Beauvais. One of the most celebrated sculptors working now, Beauvais has had a solo show at the Museum of Modern Art and installed work on the facade of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, among many other accomplishments. Working with Elizabeth Sussman, a curator at the Whitney, Dan Byers, director of the Carpenter Center for Visual Art, and Rani Singh, director of the Harry Smith Archives, Beauvais has dedicated herself to helping organize this show to tell the story of Harry Smith. In advance of the opening of Fragments of a Faith Forgotten, Carol Beauvais spoke to me about Harry Smith's life and art and what it is about this hard-to-categorize figure that fired her imagination. Thank you for coming in to talk about this really unique show that's coming up at the Whitney. Thank you so much for having me. You are known for this very arresting brand of mainly abstract contemporary sculpture. And it's possible that some people might be surprised to hear that you're curating a show about Harry Smith, who is this hard to categorize polymath best known as a collector of folk music. So just to begin, what first got you interested in Harry Smith? I got interested in Harry Smith as a result of the research I was doing on the 60s when I was making some work in the early 2000s and I would search for books online and if I ever came upon a store where two of my searches landed, I would just look through all of their holdings. And so then I found this one place that had two books or three books that were on my list and I ordered 11 books from this person. And so then he immediately emailed me back and said, well, if you like this and that, you're going to love all these other books. And he offered me a bunch of books. He was totally right. He wrote kind of a short introduction to his interests to say that he was into poetry and, you know, esoteric studies, especially 50s and 60s, and the secret knots that hold everything together. So he was in Berkeley, and my family's in Berkeley, so I arranged to go visit him. And so he, Philip Smith, became my research partner. I'll make a search that doesn't predetermine what he's going to give me. And so in the way that he interprets my instructions, I get this kind of more open-ended types of searches than I would get if I were just looking for things that I already know about. Fascinating. And he... Books for your work or books, books for to my, research books for, your Books work? for my work. At the time, they were kind of the same. So now I think there are references in my work that are much more submerged. At the time, they were kind of more on the surface. The interest in Harry Smith emerged out of you looking for books to make sculpture with. Yeah. And then uh. became in the mix of the ideas in your sculpture. Yes, absolutely. And Philip introduced me to Harry Smith. And at first, I was really not interested. I was just like, okay, yeah, no thanks. And then 
he was just persistent. And eventually he wore me down. And then I realized it's you know, my religion now. And so then I study it like a maniac. But that's where it came about. And so then the wear down <laughs> happened about was <laughs> successful around 15 years ago. And then we started working on a show of Harry Smith and Lionel Zipperin's collaboration that we showed in 2013 at Macaron, parallel to a show that I did then. Right. And that's where Elizabeth Sussman first saw that I was interested in Harry Smith. And that's when we started talking about this show. So is this show then 10 years in the making? That show at Macaron yeah. Gallery was 10 years ago. And that's yeah. when the conversation about what has now become Fragments of a Faith Forgotten at the Whitney began. Yeah. So what does that title mean, then? <laughs> Fragments of a Faith Forgotten? Where does that text come from? That title got attached to one of Harry Smith's films. I don't know who attached it. <laughs> um, it came from a book on Gnosticism that was written by a theosophist. I think theosophy is a big topic to... To dive into? A little bit, yeah. Well, uh, I think it's significant in... I and think it's significant, work. and I think one of the reasons that this show might resonate right now, there's been a big mm -hmm. development in contemporary art and in art history, like looking back to these kind of figures who maybe were outside of the main stream of art history, but were inspired by various forms of mystical traditions. Harry Smith wouldn't be the first person who came to my mind, but now that I've been inspired to look into his work by you in this show... It does strike me that it's fascinating material to mine in, in this regard. The theosophy, the occult interests. Yeah. I mean, he is someone who was associated with the beat movement, but is mainly known for his contribution to American folk music, to the musicology, but has this entire other side um, that encompasses visual art and experimental filmmaking. It's all of it inspired by this interest in theosophy, which... Maybe now to get into his origin or background story for people who don't know. I know his background's a little murky, like he was a mysterious figure. <laughs> but his parents, I think, were theosophists. From what I understand, his mom was and his dad may have been. On his dad's side, there were a lot of Masons. So I don't know to what extent his father practiced or did esoteric rites. But I think the whole community that he was in, in Washington State, there was a lot of theosophy. So it wasn't just like so idiosyncratic of his family. Right. And for people who don't know, theosophy, sort of the er, I guess you call new age religion, you know, it's a syncretist practice, bringing together a lot of different wisdoms to look at the underlying thought. It was influential for a lot of figures who are important for modern art. One of the things I think is interesting about the syncretism is that he did live in pretty isolated childhood, as I understand it, in Washington, outside of Bellingham, Washington, mm -hmm. and had this really early interest in Native communities that were nearby. He went on to study anthropology at the University of Washington for a few semesters, really, but really from when he was 15, studying, yeah. really interested in a way that was unusual in his time period. Native cultures. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, I think he was a really highly intelligent, unusual child. But I just want to set it up a little bit, which is it was very influential for the historical avant-garde. So right. like Mondrian and Kandinsky, for example, were really invested in theosophy. And the mental model that I have about it is that it was part of the story of the original abstraction or the historical avant-garde sure. move toward abstraction or development. So this is a conventional art historical narrative. Then when abstraction happens again after World War II, it doesn't need theosophy. That's kind of like the, and I'll use this term probably, I like to think about orthodox art history. I studied art history, I feel like I got a good dose of sort of like the correct, you know, like what we think, you the know, standard <laughs> the standard narrative. And he does, as you were suggesting, he falls outside of it. Only from the perspective of the way that art history has been given, does he fall outside of it. Because if you think about, I'll use the word avant-garde as if it's still relevant. It's kind of a quaint term, right? But I want to have a word to use or a term to use. So it's either avant-gardeism, for the purposes of this conversation, let's use that. But also, can we use 
the word research and kind of interchangeably. And I think that there's a lot when people are doing advanced work in art, it is a lot like scientific research, but it's not exactly. So then artists after World War II were looking at theosophy. Early 20th century needs spirituality to become abstract, but then after World War II, it doesn't need it. Anymore. It's like a booster rocket. It's a little it, bit of it, a booster it, rocket, right? Exactly. But it's not really true. I mean, artists stayed interested in the secret underpinnings of everything then and now. There's certain prejudices that are built into the standard art history that have prevented this particular story from being told. And, you know, partly it's that there is a bias for New York, and not just New York as this particular city, but New York as a city. Mm -hmm. So there's a bias that this is the real place, and that this is where the avant-garde happens, and there's another separate idea ecology in California, but it's really sort of not connected, and it's kind of marginal. And also that the real artwork happens in cities. And I think mm -hmm. that that, dealing with the second one first, that's an illusion because cities is where we present artwork. So this is where we present the research, but it's not always where the research happens, you know? Yeah. One of the things that came about or that I learned in doing the research for this show over the last several years is how much these two idea ecologies are of East and West coasts are very, over the 20th century, are very connected, and also how artists move around more. And that they are aware of each other. People who are generally based in California are going to New York, and also New Yorkers are going to California. And there's stops along the way, and that right. people are staying with each other. Right, there's more cross-pollination. There's a lot of cross-pollination. And cross-pollination is almost like the story of Harry Smith's yeah. life and maybe something that the theosophist methodology of looking across cultures for wisdom gave to him. I mean, you mentioned yeah, the totally, avant-garde yeah. idea and I look at his thing and I think about this lonely childhood in the Pacific yeah. Northwest and I think it is like not avant-gardeism, but like to the sideism. Like what yeah. seems to always interest him is stuff that he connects with because it feels on the side yeah. of the mainstream culture yeah you know like he felt like he was growing up that's psychologizing him but that's how i think about it. you know whether it was native cultures that were beneath consideration or outside of consideration at that time or indeed avant-garde art at that time period or folk music that he was discovering i'm thinking about so many different things one of the things though is that okay so imagine so he's born in 1923 washington state and imagine for a moment that we're there one thing that you kind of lose track of is how shallow the European history is on the West Coast, right. the Pacific Northwest, in 1923. It's kind of like the European influence is like a little sprinkle on top. Very deep history with like a little teeny tiny dust on it. But when Europeans did come, or Americans came and displaced the Native Americans, and then established fisheries and the canning facilities there, they kind of automatically decimated the wildlife. So there had been plentiful fish for millennia, and then the Victorians came and just like applied their powerful mechanism to fishing. And so then by the time that Harry Smith came along, it was in kind of a state of ruin, it was already kind of abandoned. So it had sort of come and gone. It was already yeah, like, been a, already been a boom like a and bust boom cycle. and bust. Yeah. yeah. And so his situation was of relative poverty. And then there was a lot of, I think, empty space. I don't know if you read the sounding for Harry Smith, the Brett Lunsford. And anyway, so he talks about Harry Smith as a little child had a there was an abandoned building that he had a museum that he... Right, yeah. <laughs> you put, I think, collecting they things, coll yeah. collected natural and cultured objects for display, you know, like as a fourth grader or something like right. that. And it sounds like he had a teacher who was very maybe theosophically minded. It sounds like, or if not theosophical, then anthroposophical, and that they had a bee 
husbandry is one of their activities. Sorry, that's a digression. But the fact that this is like this kind of situation in ruin, but then where it's really obvious the American government has been this genocidal agent and that people have been marginalized. And so the story is that his mother was teaching on an Indian reservation. That's not how he talks about being first introduced to Native American ritual. Can't remember that, that origin story. But yeah, he got really interested in it, was able to construct a recording device, was able to win the trust of people who were doing ceremonies. And um, very unusual. Very unusual. Yeah. And in this time period, like really hard. I mean, talking about, I think in the book I was reading, like 50 pounds of recording equipment. Yeah. He's, like, and he's a around. small. It's nothing you could hide you're doing. I mean, you no, know people you, no, no, know no. You have to have doing. people buy into it. But, and, and, you know, he was a small, sickly child. I don't know what he was ill with. He missed almost a year of school and was held back. And he had a hunchback, was always like a very physically small person. So how does this material, this period appear in the show? We have one section that deals with his early life. And there's some pictures that he took from his precocious period. He also got interested in this period in these string figures, which is something I didn't know about, mm -hmm. but is represented in the show that are... I don't know how to describe them. They're like cat's cradle-like string constructions. One of many things he collected throughout his life. Yeah. And that I think he believed was, he described it as one of the most universal art forms alongside dancing. Yeah, no, they're just like cat's cradles. And we have that as a familiar process in our culture. But yeah, a lot of the cultures that he studied had them. Later, he was assembling a manuscript. I mean, there's like thousands and thousands of these different string figures. And they are for storytelling, right? I think, yeah. What I really think about from that period is that you see later, aside from an interest in people, <laughs> is the notations for dance. Right. So he worked on a notational system to record dances. That's a motif that goes through his work, which is to translate from one mode of expression to another. Mm -hmm. um, Again, to the sideism, you know? Like, yeah. As a, yeah, as a, yeah, yeah, yeah. As a figure yeah. between. Yeah, yeah. I think that maybe brings us already to San Francisco. So he moves to San Francisco in the mid-40s. What draws him there? What did he get up to? So we were talking about anthropology. Something to keep in mind is anthropology was so young then. Right. <laughs> and I want to reread the section in John Tweed's book on anthropology and surrealism. And yeah, the very he handles first part, it, yeah. He handles it really well. And it's really interesting how co-emergent these two <laughs> things are. You know, I mean, anthropology dates from a bit earlier, but they are in really close dialogue. And I think that, in a way, brings me to Berkeley, where he moved to Berkeley in 46. And I think he had planned to work with Paul Radin, who was an anthropologist at Berkeley. And Berkeley at the time was, okay, so here's a counter narrative to the New York story. So Berkeley was one of the centers of the avant-garde in the United States after World War II. And it was this real literary center where people are doing experiments in poetry. There was like a poetry renaissance, obviously science. Anthropology was like way more kind of wild you know, before it got more academic, more academic and more, what do I want to say? I mean, later when you study things that don't go in the narrative, there's like forbidden anthropology now and there's forbidden science now that you would call paranormal. But at the time you could deal with ghosts, <laughs> you know, like that wasn't outside of the rules. Right. And if you were a young man interested in ghosts, that would be the discipline you were drawn, drawn <laughs> sure. to. Sure, yeah. yeah. I'm sure there, it was determined by a lot of things. But he got an assistantship with Paul Radin, and I don't know how long that lasts. It doesn't seem like you know he's somebody who really could deal with systems of authority, <laughs> structures of oppression. You know, he was like very against. And Fascinating it, <laughs> because he's so interested in systems and structures, but yes. like alternate systems and structures. Alternate. And I think that you could generalize and say, it's not that there aren't politics and power dynamics within the systems that he's looking at, but it's not the type of top-down 
coercive control that you have in nation states or in really organized religion. So the stuff that he's looking at really tends to be by people who have more freedom from such structures. And that seems to be something that he's really focused on throughout his life. And that's one of the interests in folk music rather than courtly music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, San Francisco in the 40s is just like the germinal moment of the counterculture. You know, that's just yeah. percolating there. Yeah. Pretty quickly after he's there, right, he becomes immersed in like the experimental scene, yeah. art scene, and then the jazz scene, yeah. the music scene. Yeah. Yeah, no, it seems like he found his way right to the center of it, like, immediately. He was there for a couple years. He went then to San Francisco. It was from Berkeley to San Francisco. From Berkeley to San Francisco. He was doing some work, presumably volunteer work or some kind of work for trade at SFMOMA in their art and cinema program, really? which was, like, the first experimental film program in the United States. And that's really the birthplace of it. I know he had some murals at a famous jazz club, Jimbo's Bop City. I think those are yeah. lost now. Yeah. That's right, yeah. And then, like you were saying, also was an enthusiast of jazz. And he had these, again, working between mediums, had these visual art experiments to try and put the music of Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie into visual form. Yes, so he was making these paintings. So at the same time that he was making films, he was working for art and cinema and working for them doing stuff like chasing down films from people like Kenneth Anger or Oscar Fischinger. And he went to LA and met with them for art and cinema and then also showing his work at art and cinema. So they had already, they already like, this guy's a collector. We can make use of his. I uh, guess. Yeah. His, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He's, instinct. he's good at, he's good at finding things. It's really impressive because now it's so easy. But at the time, his ability to search and locate and aggregate was like an incredible talent. Similar, what I was saying about transcribing the dances for the Native Americans up north, then he was making a correspondence between notes in a song and then his painting. So, and then he had taken photographs of these paintings and would project them and then play the song that corresponds to them. And then he would take a pointer and show you where you were. You know, On the visual in the, image. In the visual image, yeah. Oh, so, I mean, it's sort of like it, it's a version of scoring a movie. It's just that the movie is still. And the score is moving. So those were thrown away by disgruntled landlords later. But the slides exist. We've blown them up in we're showing them. And it's so exciting to be able to see them. We have some really good reproductions in the show. I think it's a fascinating thing about this San Francisco is parenthetical, but how avant-garde film interests mixed with the music scene there and really the light show, the rock and roll yeah, yeah, light yeah, show yeah, yeah. comes out yeah, of uh, yeah. the San Francisco artists working yeah. between those two things. And, you know, whenever you're at a rock concert today and uh, a music concert today and it's, you know, charged with light music, that is these folks in San Francisco yeah, absolutely. Who, yeah. who created they that. That is avant-garde. <laughs> they were way avant. You know, they were way yeah. ahead of that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, when Philip was first showing me Harry Smith's films and his close friend at the time in San Francisco, late 40s, Jordan Belson's films, you know, it's just like, oh, these Jordan Belson films look like screensavers, you know, or these Harry Smith films look so familiar, but it's like, well, no, I mean, he invented that. <laughs> no, the kind of like trippy light show thing, like Jordan Belson invented that. Yeah, they, and that <laughs> In some ways, before experimental film is this, well, maybe they develop at the same time because he's working in SF MoMA. We yeah. were talking about this in the art context. But at the same time that it's object of 
sort of abstract contemplation, painting like contemplation, it's also like part of this like performance context. It's very yeah. bodily, you know, like yeah. it's mixed in with music and dancing and, and all of that. And I do think that is a tradition that runs alongside the mainstream art history that people don't talk about. Yes. Enough. Similar to what I was saying about there's an illusion that it happens in the city because it's presented in the city. There's an illusion that it's painting, it's static, because, well, that's easier. Not easier. Uh, it's a more self-supporting You don't need all the other people there. Expression, yeah. yeah. And also, it comes with a support system where it could have an art dealer, it can have a collector, and then once it's movable, people can invest in it. And then... A painting, because it has, it's stable, so we can like approach it and we can criticize it, we can talk about it, we can theorize about it, because it's not going anywhere, we can keep thinking about it. But also, because it can be sold, it can support its own research. You know, you could take some of the money from selling the painting and put it into running the archive for example. And then you could go and study the paintings later and you could keep all the archival material together. And so painting has this kind of Darwinian fitness that any performance-based practice is just doesn't have. Even though in its in your relationship with it, in your art experience of it, it can be very powerful, but it you know it doesn't come with its own support system. Or it undermines its support system. I love the idea of the Darwinian fitness of painting <laughs> as the ideal art object. It's amazing. And maybe that's just an opening to just say a word before we move on to New York about his finances, because he is someone who a lot of his work is lost. Like you mentioned, yeah. his landlords threw out some yeah. of his important work. And he is someone who was really interested in the living dimension of culture. Yeah. Even I think among the anthropologists, you know, there's a whole critique of anthropology about treating cultures as dead. Right, right. Document. He really was seemingly very engaged with them as living and yeah. inspired by them as like, these are like communities, uh, meaningful practices. In yeah. any case, he was involved in living culture that doesn't have that Darwinian fitness in terms yeah. of, you know, like becoming objects that get sold away and traded away. And that affected his life, you know. He, he was someone who really lived uh, seemingly pretty mysterious how he survived, yeah. actually. Yeah, he lived in real poverty and want. In 1950, he gets one of the first Guggenheim grants to make a film that allows him to move to New York. So how did that affect his creative path? I don't totally get how his funding was working, but he was getting some funding before he moved to New York from Hilary Bay, who was the first director of the Guggenheim, which at the time was the Museum of Non-Objective Art. And she was a real card-carrying Kandinskyite who then produced Point Line Plane, a Kandinsky book, and was sending it out west. And so then there are letters where Harry Smith is talking about how into this book he is and is out sort of like proselytizing for this non-objective artwork. And, um, you know, she really liked Rudolf Bauer, who's like a little bit even more kind of like clean lines and geometric in its expression. And it looks very kind of early 20th century avant-garde um, abstraction. So, and he was making work like that. And then this film had those characteristics. And also she was making work like that. At the same time, he was making this kind of abstract expressionist looking work. The jazz paintings we just talked about are like that. They have these kind of splatter, free expression shapes. They remind you of Jackson Pollock maybe at a distance. If you get closer to them, they have a much more animated look. So they're very influenced, I think, by Oscar Fischinger. They're almost like a cartoon. They really presage something like Chicago imagism, sort of like comic books from the 70s. But one of the amazing discoveries that happened kind of recently was- Around the show. Around the show, there is an archive. There's some stuff at the Getty, but it's mostly from the end of his life, 70s, 80s. The other stuff, since he doesn't have a stable place to live, sometimes he doesn't have a place to live at all, is located with his collaborators. So when you find one of his collaborators and then you look around in their papers, then you find some Harry Smith stuff. So there have been all these almost like archeological 
discoveries in the process of putting the show together. And a lot of it has been aided by the fact that people know there's a show at the Whitney. So they're like, oh, like I have something you might be interested in. It's like, yes, we are interested. Wait, wait, what's that? Shakes, um, shakes, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's actually been helpful that it's been like a rumor for a long time that we're working on the show. And um, that's where we found some of these slides of the jazz paintings with Jordan Belson's stuff in San Francisco. One of the discoveries was Philip Smith was saying, you know, this one jazz painting looks so much like this Jackson Pollock painting. And I'm like, no way. No, no. He didn't see it. Impossible. Even if he saw it, maybe black and white. But he persisted. <laughs> and then he found, okay, yeah, well, here's the evidence. And by the way, Jackson Pollock had a show at SF MoMA in 1945. And they bought that painting. And here's an account from Jordan Belson's widow. And she said that Jordan said they, he and Harry went to see that painting all the time. So I was like, uh -huh. oh. Okay, so the whole thing that we said and that everybody has said about his being an outsider artist is totally false. He is always aloof, you know? In between, again, in between. You know, he's in yeah. between traditions, you know, and he's, he's absorbing, yeah, he's, he's yeah. looking syncretically, absorbing things from different, yeah. different sources. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but I mean, he's totally aware of what's going on. When he moves to New York then, well, that's the moment when Hillary Vega gets kicked out of the Guggenheim. Funding source gone. So what did he do? A couple of things. He went to Lionel Ziprin, Lionel and Joanne Ziprins, and they are a really interesting couple, and that's an archive that we've studied a lot, where a lot of the Harry Smith material is. Some of the most interesting objects or yeah. images in this show are from the Inkweed Arts yes. uh, work, which you've worked with before. That, yeah, that's, so that the was the show of in your show at Macaron yeah. in 2013. Uh, describe these objects. They actually do, again, fall outside of like categories people might have. So Inkweed was run by Joanne and Lionel Ziprin. They employed Jordan Belson, Harry Smith, Bruce Connor had, I guess his earliest paid work was for Inkweed. Inkweed was a subversive and esoteric greeting card company. And they were maybe the first to have that idea. And their designs were really advanced. And Lionel Zipperin was a Kabbalah scholar. So he a was. lot of these images have this kind of Kabbalistic imagery or yeah or almost mystical symbolism for sure and he's such an interesting person he's from a long line of important rabbis then i guess during the 50s 60s he had this avant-garde period where he wasn't as observant he was still very religious but he wasn't as observant and so he taught kabbalah to the people who are associated with beat and in the 60s, too, people like Tony Conrad, and in the 50s, like Wallace Berman and Marjorie Cameron. He was the kind of ground zero for this Kabbalah study in the post-war American avant-garde. But he, as a religious person, was also, I think, really ambivalent about it. So it wasn't like he didn't publish, he didn't get out there, but he was an important poet and just like a secret hero of that time. And I think Inkwe only lasted a few years, right? I mean, this it, yeah. it, was, it was an experimental idea. It was a few years, and, and it, then, it, yeah, then it became the haunted ink bottle, but I don't think they really lasted that long either. But I should say a few words about Joanne. One of her best friends was Lena Horn, and she had a lot of connection with the uh, jazz world in New York, and so their household was a place where people went before they would go have their set at the five spot or before they would go see people at the five spot. And so it was like a really important meeting place for the post-war American avant-garde. So it's in this period, early 50s, and this, like you said, financial shock or whatever, he loses his yeah. source of support. That's also where his most famous initiative, the Anthology of American Folk Music, comes in. I understand he was just looking to raise some money to live right, off of yeah. his record collection. Right. I'm going to dog ear that. Yeah. And then say that the effect that moving to New York had on his work, I think, of course, there is the esoteric study. And, and the story was that he would go to New York Public Library, study esoteric books, 
bring back his knowledge, talk to Lionel about it. Lionel would talk to him about Kabbalah and that they would have these kind of study sessions every night. And yeah, that made its way into some of the films and graphic work, but just along the lines of this Jackson Pollock discovery. <laughs> so his films in New York, they look very Dada surrealist. They look like Max Ernst in a way. And they have figures and the figures are doing surreal kind of stuff. So I had always thought he didn't know about abstract expressionism, but so now it's clear that he did. He knew about it and when he got there, he did something kind of deliberately unfashionable. Mm. Abstract expressionism was really in full swing in the 50s in New York, and it's not that he didn't know about it. It's like what you're saying about having a posture of outsider oppositional defiance, <laughs> at least partially. Of course, we don't know what his motivations were, but he definitely didn't know about it. Well, it could possibly also be that uh, by that time that narrative had kicked in, you know, that the, the booster rocket was off and you know, <laughs> what had interested him about abstraction. That wasn't really how it was received right, right. as it was promoted in the 40s and 50s. Right, right. And maybe he didn't find his community of yeah. abex people. So then around the same time, he is trying to sell his big collection of folk music and then he is encouraged by... Mose Ash to... Who's the owner of Folkways Record. To say he was selling his record collection is a little bit... <laughs> it's not exactly capture what's happening. These are pretty <laughs> rare you. records. No, They're rare, rare records. They, <laughs> yeah. they, there was really regional music. So yeah. Before kind of in the 60s, you really get mass youth culture. Yeah. There were all these like little regional records that weren't necessarily distributed everywhere. And, and right. he, as someone, was really interested in locally situated stuff and yeah. obsessed with this stuff. Yeah, and I think one of the things that characterized the records that he sought out were that it was before, you know, it's like 27 to 33 or something. So it's like when you first have the kind of equipment that makes mass recording possible and then 33 when this market sort of collapses because of the depression. But aside from the fact that this market collapses, there's an innocence of the way that people are singing because they haven't heard themselves or anyone really being recorded. So they're not doing a kind of self-conscious vocal styling. Mm. It's not that it's not self-conscious, but it hasn't been objectified. There hasn't been a process of self-objectification. That's a theme that I really see throughout his work is this interest in, we touched on it earlier, of not objectifying. And you were talking about a critique of anthropology, that you're objectifying other cultures, kind of using them as examples. I would submit that he is 100% against objectification at all times. And that is what makes the reception of his work difficult too, is that it's alive and it's pure process. And he doesn't take the step of thinking, what is this object going to look like when it's finished, what's the end result going to be? It's always in the process of cooperating with whatever's being made. And so then I see that is when he's looking at people who are doing string figures or he's looking at people who are doing different folk craft art traditions, he's actually looking at them as almost like crowdsourcing. You know, it's so like, oh, well, here's an example of what a person would do. And I'm going to absorb and learn that. Although the anthology of American folk music, which is what came out of this yeah. collaboration and is what he's best known for. Yes. This set of records that it is an object. I mean, it became a big True. sensation yeah. and in some ways is the foundation for the folk revival of the late 50s and 60s. Yeah. Right. And clearly you can see that there's some self-presentation that he wants to communicate in the object to people. So I guess what I would say about that too is that when he does produce an object, it's kind of for money. He'd rather get money by just having people give it to them, you know, it's sort of like, hey. I understand he was always yeah, asking yeah, people for money. Yeah, exactly. Like, oh, how do you do? Are you rich? You know? <laughs> well, that's um, a literal story. That's not a joke. That's an actual, that's an actual story. He introduced it actual, himself to people Actual story. Way. Yeah, true story. And he, yeah, I mean, a lot of times could just do, and you know, around the same time, you know, maybe a couple of years after the anthology, he was doing esoteric research for Arthur Young, 
who's a scientist, created the Bell helicopter and then later started Consciousness Institute, but that was his paid work. And he did some other research with different scientists at the time. There aren't that many examples, though, of him as an artist making a product for the sake of making an object. Not to say that this isn't a brilliant, a really important cultural offering, and of course a lot of things are made for money. How would you describe Mahagoni? Because that is an opus, you know, it's a four hour film that is gonna be shown in this show. I mean, the dates on it, to give people an idea, are 1970 to 1980. Yeah, yeah. He Filmed for a few years, seems like 70 to 73, maybe, and then there was a lot of editing after it. And, and what is it? Maybe <laughs> describe for people what it is. So the Bertolt Brecht Weil opera Mahagoni, it's the same period as the anthology music. Mm -hmm. The music that he collected was from that same period. In this opera that was first staged in 1930, and then it's about America, but it's like sort of like this Jungian version of America being looked at from Germany. And <laughs> he shot a lot of film, a lot of film that was mostly at the Chelsea Hotel and he's living there. There's four categories of types of things that he filmed. There were people, there were nature scenes, animations, and Scenes? I don't know about that last one. <laughs> but then he made a really elaborate structure for their editing. And what Philip says, and I think this is a really good theory, is that in a way it's a parody about structuralist filmmaking. Structuralist film became sort of like the... Avant-garde film. It's the avant-garde, but it's like the, when the avant-garde kind of ossifies into academicism, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think it's like to the extreme parody of structuralist film. It's gorgeous. It's really great to see projected. We're installing it now and I can finally see it in all its glory. It looks really amazing. Over the 10 years that he was editing it and talking about it, said many fanciful things about how it could be projected uh, on a billiard table, on the boxing ring. And we are not projecting it on a boxing ring, but it's like we've tipped over a boxing ring and we're projecting it on the wall that that makes. That's part of my role as one of the curators, as an artist curator, is to not be too objective, not to be irresponsible. I feel very responsible, but I think that there are clear signals that make it legible to a viewer that this is not true. This isn't the objective take on this work. This has been animated. This has been, there's an artist who's animated this work, who's cooperated with this work to do something to, you know. Well, I guess maybe to give it to life again, reanimate it, make it a living process as he yeah. would have thought. I was going to ask you about this. I <laughs> have so many other questions for you about the show, but <laughs> it seems like a focus of the show, if I understand it, is about how his sensibility, as someone who kind of blurred Making stuff with collecting stuff yeah. does feel contemporary yeah. because yeah. the lines between making and collecting have been kind of blurred. And then here you are, you know, an artist who is also working as a curator. Yeah. We started this conversation, you talking about how you were collecting books uh, right. for the purposes of an artwork. So, yeah, I guess, is that why you're drawn to him? Is that kind of sensibility? Yeah, I think I'm drawn to him because he had total commitment to what he was doing. I think that's really inspiring. And the stakes are not about his standing or his career or making money or what people think. It's really about bigger problems like the entire world, civilization. Those are the stakes. I think that's what the stakes should be. I think that's a pretty good place to end it. Um, <laughs> you know, and we haven't even had a chance to talk about his paper airplane question. <laughs> but I'm so excited to see the show. Thank you so much for being here with us to talk about Harry Smith. My great pleasure. Thanks for having me. That's it for this week's episode. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, please take a moment to rate and review our show. It will help other listeners discover what we're up to. 
The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manalili and Caroline Goldstein. Thanks for listening and see you next week. <laughs>